welcome to Nerds at Church, a podcast about nerdery and the Bible. I'm Pastor Emily, and I use pronouns like they, them, theirs. And I'm Pastor Kay, and I use pronouns like she and her. In this episode, we'll discuss the fourth Sunday after Epiphany, also known as Lectionary 4, which this year falls on January 30th. Check out the episode description for links to the Bible passages and other references we make in this episode. So today, our deep dive is on the topic of holy troublemakers, or Mm -hmm. the idea that good trouble is holy. Yes. This concept comes from the late Representative John Lewis, who talked about good trouble and the importance of troublemaking, in fact, especially in movements for human rights and civil rights. And so, of course, we couldn't talk about that without talking about him. He is one of the people who, throughout his life, was a holy troublemaker, as we might say, one who stirred up good trouble. He was very instrumental in the civil rights movement and um, then took that into his work in politics and in his elected capacity as a representative for the United States Congress. Yeah. And of course, one name that many Americans think of when they think of John Lewis uh, connected to the civil rights era is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who mm-hmm. also spent plenty of his life creating lots of good trouble on behalf of others. Uh, and we also acknowledge that not just with him, also with everyone else on this list and mm-hmm. really all human beings because we're Lutheran and we're into this, uh, <laughs> but no one person is perfect except Jesus. <laughs> Jesus gets to be the exception to pretty much all rules. But much. but Reverend King was just as fallible as any other person and stories do go around about mm-hmm. his complicated marital issues and there are some stories about some of his academic work but ultimately speaking what we remember him for is his good trouble and Mm -hmm. particularly when we remember him it's important to remember him as he was not just a fallible human being but also with all of his actual viewpoints and goals and not just the stuff that is whitewashed or made simpler for a large audience and so there is a Facebook post that's been going around uh, for quite a while that lists uh, several quotes from him that an awful lot of people who like to quote him, especially on the anniversary of his birth, don't really acknowledge. Mm, I love that one. That's yes. Been going every year for a couple of years now. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we remember him, we remember not only that he fought for voting rights, but also that he fought against the evils of capitalism and for unions and uh, so many other wonderful causes. Mm -hmm. And we'll try and find those posts, see if we can find them and link to them in our episode description for you all. If you have a Dr. King quote that you're particularly fond of that isn't one of the usual half dozen, we would love if you would share that with us on social media. That would be great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is always a good thing to share more of the fuller truth. I took a class in seminary called The Theology of Martin Luther King Jr. It was taught by uh, the now late Dr. Pete Perro, Albert Pete Perro, who was part of the civil rights movement and so like had known Dr. King and that was fantastic right. but it actually a- actually gets into the deeper theology that grounded Dr. King's holy troublemaking. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Other folks who stirred up some good trouble are Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera who are two trans women of color. Marsha P. Johnson is a Black trans woman, and Sylvia Rivera was a um, Latina trans woman. And they stirred up trouble from the Stonewall riots. There are different rumors about who was there and who threw the first brick or high heel during the Stonewall uprising. But also since then, they spent their lives fighting for trans women, especially trans women of color, and for queer rights. And they were not similar to Dr. King. They were not treated well in their lifetimes. They were not approved of. Um, right. King had really low approval numbers among white people when he was killed. And Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera 
struggled a lot economically in their lives and and that is yeah. partly because of their commitments around uh, mutual aid and community and, and community care, but also partly just because of the situation in our country and the evils of capitalism. Yeah. Any conversation about queer rights is meaningless without them. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about Archbishop Oscar Romero, who we did a deep dive on last Lent, and so we'll link to that in our episode description. We did that deep dive with Francisco Herrera, Mm -hmm. but Archbishop Romero didn't start out as a holy troublemaker. He started out and he was pretty conservative, pretty toe the line, follow the rules. Very much the alignment of lawful good, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, and then started to get a sense for how the law was not actually good and and steadily became more chaotic yeah i wonder maybe that's it that like holy troublemakers and good trouble (laughs) making good trouble is just chaotic chaotic good good. yeah yeah as an alignment that's fun i like that yeah so he then started once he had his own form of conversion to understanding the truth about the harms and who was being oppressed and experiencing violence in his communities, he started to advocate more clearly on um, with the oppressed and with the poor. And uh, ultimately, he was killed while presiding at communion. So if that is not a clear, holy troublemaker, I don't know what is. Yeah. And then to move out of our more historical examples and into the modern day, one person who we would both suggest that you look into is a name that many of us learned on or around June 27th, 2015, when Brie Newsom Bass uh, committed her famous act of civil disobedience and was arrested for removing the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House grounds uh, in the aftermath of the Charleston church shooting. And since then, she has been very active on social media, particularly Twitter, Mm -hmm. engaging and teaching many people about the ongoing struggle for civil rights uh, and the very different perspective that growing up Black in America uh, gives a person compared to growing up white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she is one of the people that I think both of us follow. Yes, and I definitely credit her with a lot of what I've learned in the last several years. This goes around every once in a while, but... um... If you are wanting to learn more, particularly from people who don't share the same demographic identities as you. Which is one of the best ways to learn. Mm -hmm. One of the best ways to do that is to follow people on Twitter. And it's follow them and do not comment. Just follow them. You can retweet. You can heart. But don't comment for a very long time. I That's the main way that I use Twitter besides publicity for nerds at church. <laughs> and Brie Newsom Bass does an amazing job with breaking down and making clear um, the political decisions that are getting made. And when there's like particular political spin, she cuts right through that and is like, oh, that's what you think it's saying. No, the news is saying this, but like the reality is this is why this is happening, or this is a repercussion of this action. Yes. And for our listeners who don't really use Twitter, I would point out that when you use Twitter this way, you don't have to be constantly shackled to your phone. Like, Mm -hmm. this is a way that you can use Twitter that you browse when you have the energy, when you Mm -hmm. have the emotional bandwidth. And you, you can actually turn off the notifications, which I have. Yeah, I don't have notifications on. Yeah, and that uh, a a lot of the people who make assumptions about how Twitter works assume that you basically are constantly shackled to the app and you really don't have to be. So I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, Twitter's pretty easy. You don't actually have to tweet. Yeah, no. To be on Twitter. It's very possible that your voice is not the one that needs to be heard. Mm Mm-hmm. You know? Bingo. And when you do retweet people, that's amplifying other people's voices that are important voices to be heard. Other kind of more group stuff is the Black Liberation Movement, obviously, has been stirring up holy trouble for almost a decade now, because I think it was in 2014 that it was really both Black Lives Matter and the Black Liberation Movement, movements for Black lives 
especially in the during the pandemic right in right. the twin cities in order to get any sort of criminal justice system to do anything yeah but that's been the case in the twin cities i know when i was in des moines the local black liberation movement was huge both in protesting against police brutality in organizing for showing up at city council meetings and they're part of how the voting rights for people who had been convicted of felonies got restored in Iowa. Iowa was one of the last states to do that. Yeah. And to be the source for a lot of mutual aid groups, which is kind of like a bunch of really great work that they're doing throughout the country, not just in those places, but those are the ones that I am most familiar with. And in Chicago, I know this one from seminary, but the group Southsiders Organizing for Unity and Liberation. And they do a lot of really great organizing. There's pushes to end cash bail in Chicago. And I think officially maybe they have, but they're still working on playing that out. But all of these groups have done nonviolent direct action. Right? It's about taking action in ways that poke and provoke because just voting is not enough. And just advocating is not enough. And especially in red states, we could advocate all we wanted in Iowa. And that didn't mean that the legislature was going to do anything. And so when yeah. we did, when we took more direct action, is that's when the troublemaking is troublemaking. And that's when change actually started starts to, to happen. Yeah, we started to actually see change happen. And one recent example of that is the now fairly famous clip of when our current press secretary, Jen Psaki, responded to a question by asking, what, do you expect us to send free tests to everyone in America? Mm -hmm. And social media resoundingly responded, yes, because there are so many countries that are quite literally doing that for their citizens. And mm -hmm. now... Okay, yes, it's not a lot of tests, but now the government is starting to work on doing that kind of yes. thing. And masks, for that matter. Yeah, four tests per residential address. I'm still not clear why we can't get masks with the tests. They're apparently working on masks, too, I see now. but Yeah, but I, those are like going to pharmacies. Yeah, that I, I don't get it. But they're putting in an effort, which mm -hmm. is more than what's happening before. And a lot of that is because people responded so viscerally to that moment uh, mm -hmm. and did so very loudly uh, throughout social media and also uh, in, frankly, the traditional media as well. Yeah. Also, that's how student loan repayment got pushed back some more. And yeah. 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 There have been a lot of examples. And while we talk about this, particularly when we talk about modern day holy troublemakers, one of the aspects of activism that is I think starting to be talked about more is the fact that you need to take care of yourself when you commit yourself to activism. You need to remember to have happier things in your life when you are struggling with all of this. If you have decided to start paying attention to the news and you find yourself doom scrolling every night, you need to not doom scroll as much and also have some happier things going on. And so my last example for our current day holy troublemakers is also one of my favorites and also <laughs> proof that secretly the internet is truly strictly for cat pictures, okay? Which is a theory I've had since I was young. And that is Jorts. <laughs> Jorts is a cat who lives in an office building and sort of accidentally became famous through a Am I the Jerk post a few weeks ago, which is not -I technically what it's called. Yes. As a result of becoming famous, started a Twitter account. I mean, clearly the cat did not start the Twitter account. One of the employees who takes care of the cat started the Twitter account. But now there is this Twitter account for this cat uh, named Jorts, who had the option of cashing in on this. Like when you become internet famous, you can make some money off of that if you want. But instead of creating merch, what Jorts said, I hope you can hear the air quotes there, <laughs> was that uh, he suggested that you draw I love jorts in orange marker on things that you already owned and take the money that you would have spent on that merch and donate it to a mutual aid organization, to a union uh, fund, or mm -hmm. to uh, a strike a fund. Or to a strike fund, yes. 
-hmm. And he could have cashed in, but he didn't. And over time, he came out uh, consistently as being pro-trans rights, pro-union, uh, very strongly pro-union, and just generally against the evils of capitalism and for human rights. And also happens to be a delightfully adorable orange cat who is not <laughs> the brightest bulb in the box and <laughs> by any means um and has a friend named jean who uh yes jean and jorts those names go together for a reason and as in jeans and jorts oh jeans as in jean shorts Apparently, Jean was the first office cat, and then they got a, a, a male orange cat to go with her, uh, and he became Jorts. I did not make that connection. Thank yes. you. And Jean is the uh, more intelligent of the pair, uh, who frequently tells Jorts very important things about unions, and Jorts will pass those along through the Twitter account. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've got to tell you, I... I realize that it's not actually the cat who is posting on Twitter, but that Twitter account is giving me life and reminding me that there is hope in the universe uh, for the last several weeks. And I just mm -hmm. love that. So Yeah, somebody posted the other day about George's posts about unions and supporting unions, which is another group that is full of um, holy troublemakers and yes. folks who make good trouble and, and is having a resurgence right now as people are at the end of their rope and not willing to literally put their lives on the lines for a company to pay them less than a living wage. Yeah. But yeah, George, somebody posted about, somebody tweeted about George and they were like, yeah, George has been like supporting all the unions and labor and now all the cats on Twitter, because there are a bunch of Twitter accounts that yes. are like cats, are talking with George and pretty soon they're going to form a union and then we're going to be in real trouble. <laughs> I am absolutely looking forward to that. Yeah. And there have also been some delightful fan works uh, wandering around the internet. My personal favorite is someone rewrote the lyrics to Jolene, the famous Dolly Parton song, as O oh, Jean being sung by Jorts. <laughs> and it's Jorts singing to Jean, asking Jean to help him get out of a closet that he's trapped himself in. Aww. It's adorable. That's fantastic. So. So it's not all, you know, unions and anti-capitalism. There's also just general wackiness, mm -hmm. which is part of what's so uplifting about it. And we'll try and find the Am I the Jerk <laughs> link for Jorts, for those of you who are somehow magically not involved, <laughs> yes. not aware of this. Please don't put margarine on your coworkers, even if they are a cat. Like, actually, especially if they're a cat, but whatever, you know, species yeah. they are. Just, yeah, no. Margarine on coworkers, not good. Right. So any discussion about holy troublemakers and folks who make good trouble would not be complete on this podcast, at least, without talking about the holy troublemakers in the Bible. And there are many, so we're not going to talk about all of them. Oh my goodness, no. Um, for example, we don't talk about Jesus, and he's definitely <laughs> one of them. Yes, possibly the holiest of troublemakers. I'm not really sure how that works. Or the troubliest of holy makers. <laughs> but two of my favorites are Shifra and Pua, who are midwives in the beginning of Exodus. And they are told by Pharaoh to kill all the baby boys. And they don't. They help parents give birth and have kids. And then they tell when Pharaoh challenges them on this, they say, they were just so fast. We weren't, th they had the kids before we got there. I don't know. Funny how that only happened when the babies had certain genitalia. But, mm. you know, it, things um, happen. But then also, like, as it progresses, they continue this. And they are, are one of the main reasons that Moses is alive. So they help Moses to live. And then when... Moses's mom can't hide Moses any longer. His sister helps him survive when they put him in a basket and float, and he floats down the Nile. Um, and she follows and then tells Pharaoh's daughter, who finds him, that she knows someone who could be a wet nurse for Moses. And so then Moses goes mm. back to his mom and is now like his mom is now being paid by Pharaoh's daughter <laughs> to raise her own kid. Who then has to go back to them but there's yeah yeah that story is filled with good trouble for sure 
and evil. Like, I mean, you can't really have good trouble, trouble unless there's something you're making evil. the trouble yeah. against something. Yeah. Yeah. And another story uh, that I love from the Hebrew scriptures, uh, which is mm -hmm. a little lesser known, which happens across a couple of books uh, in the Bible, um, is the daughters of Zelophehad. Zelophehad was an Israelite man who had five daughters and then died. And because of the inheritance laws at the time, it wasn't clear on what should happen to his estate because it was assumed that if you were going to have children, there would be a male child eventually mm -hmm. for to inherit. And then they would take care of any female siblings. And the daughters of Zelophehad went to, at first, Moses mm -hmm. repeatedly saying, we are human beings. We deserve to inherit our family's uh, wealth. We need to be able to uh, look after ourselves. We have to eat. Come on. And they show up a few different times throughout the Hebrew scriptures, uh, especially memorable in the book of Numbers, uh, chapter 27, and I think also 39. But basically, if you use one of those Bible search websites to search for Zelophehad, <laughs> Z-E-L-O-P-H-E-H-A-D, uh, you will be able to find them because they're always called this. Uh, we'll, and... we'll also try and put in... Yes, we'll, we'll put a link for hopefully everybody that we're talking about in the biblical. Sure. And they again and again go back to Moses. And meanwhile, Moses is doing, you know, a bunch of other stuff, which is really the focus of most of these uh, books of the Bible. Eventually, Moses dies. They go visit Joshua because he's now the guy. <laughs> and uh, eventually, Joshua has to agree that, yes, you're right. Yes, you do deserve to inherit. Yes, this should have happened several years ago. And we're going to arrange things so that you all are uh, properly given justice and able to continue to live your lives i mean and so moses actually does say yes because they go to moses moses goes to god and god is like duh moses the women are right yeah do what they say but moses doesn't actually do anything right and then later like takes what what god has said and like puts restrictions on it more right and then joshua yeah yeah in theory so I love the Daughters of Zelophehad because if you need an example of uh, women causing trouble, uh, they are a lovely yes. option for that. I love them as well. They are fantastic. Mm -hmm. And then as I was thinking about it, our first reading is from Jeremiah. And I'm pretty sure Jeremiah, well, my initial question was, doesn't Jeremiah end up running around in his underwear? To which my initial response was, I don't think Jeremiah was ever played by Richard Gere. No. <laughs> Which, if you have never seen the Richard Gere movie King David, probably wouldn't make any sense. But there's right. a scene where Richard Gere dances around in a loincloth. So. so if you're a Richard Gere person, maybe check it out. Sure. And then I like looked it up. And in fact, Jeremiah 13, there's definitely um, an accounting of God telling Jeremiah to get a loincloth that can be wrapped around his loins. And then he's told to like bury it for a long time and it gets dirty and gross. And then God is like, exactly. I'm assuming that makes more sense in context. It makes a lot more sense in context. It's a metaphor for, you know, the people of Israel or God's ah. people or something like that. Don't bury your light under a bushel. Mm -hmm. Or y'all are getting a little bit grody and maybe go for a shower. <laughs> Clean up your actions a little bit. Yeah. One of the other biblical characters who is a holy troublemaker who I absolutely adore is the Syrophoenician woman Yay. in Mark or the Canaanite woman in Matthew. But she is fantastic and she takes Jesus' words, Jesus' insult, Jesus calls her a dog. She takes that and flips it around for Jesus. So she says, oh, you think the dogs don't deserve crumbs. You think that only the children get food and we're dogs. Well, even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. And in Mark in particular, Jesus says, your words, what you have said, changes things. And so yeah. her daughter is healed. And I just love that. Space. It isn't often that someone manages to stand Jesus's words on their head. And right. he is so good at doing that to other people. Mm -hmm. As we talk about all of these, both biblical holy troublemakers and real life holy troublemakers one of the books that i think does a great job of well for me it did a great job of helping me think through what it looks like to make holy trouble 
to make good trouble and to do it in a way that is rooted in faith is Faith Rooted Organizing by Alexia Salvatierra. And it's just fantastic. So we'll link to that book. If you have the opportunity to read it, you should. There are some great examples and some great insights that they provide. Yeah. And our final biblical example of a holy troublemaker is actually an example of someone that Jesus made up because (laughs) this is a character from one of Jesus's parables. And that is the persistent widow Mm -hmm. who insisted on banging on the doors and windows of the uh, judge who would not give her justice at all hours of the day and night until he finally said, fine, just go away and let me sleep. (laughs) And uh, I, I, adore the persistent widow because i have absolutely known those people and they are some of the best of the folks on the earth yes but i also love the persistent widow because she's essentially fictional Mm -hmm. and we have so many fictional examples of good troublemakers that we can go to from both uh, ancient and modern sources personally speaking i think one of the more memorable good troublemaker examples uh, in the stuff that I was watching when I was a kid was from the Star Trek movie Undiscovered Country, Mm. uh, where the Enterprise crew manages to break a whole bunch of very important laws and put themselves uh, on the line, uh, both physically and legally, uh, by uncovering and stopping a conspiracy to start a war. Hmm. And that was definitely formative for me. Yeah, that's, you know, a big one. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about in the Divergent series, in the second book, Insurgent, there's the conflict continues to brew and it comes to a head and erudite and all those against erudite are kind of coming to a head to like fight it out. And one of the things that I love is I think there are a lot of holy troublemakers and some of them are armed with guns that will kill. Um, But there's also members of the Amity faction, which is the faction that is the most pacifist and and sometimes the most passive, which is pacifist and passive, not always the same thing, most of the time not the same thing. But for Amity, there's like a clear connection there. And yet there are some members of Amity of the Amity faction who decide to go to the war to like the location for the war or for the big battle and they intervene with they have like some tasers so that they can like protect themselves but not necessarily kill anybody and they have they like have medical supplies and stuff so that they can care for people who are injured and I just love that space of trying like intentionally putting themselves at the line of conflict in a capacity hoping to bring peace hoping yeah. to help people. Absolutely. I think as we describe who are the holy troublemakers in fiction, we should probably also give a few ex- at least one example of maybe not a holy troublemaker, maybe just a troublemaker or two. <laughs> and the truth is is that the Weasley twins from the Harry Potter series are not necessarily always good and holy troublemakers. Yeah, like they spend the most of the series just making trouble for trouble's sake, which is usually pretty funny, although not always. Yeah. But uh they do eventually become good troublemakers uh when they start their shop and they join the order. Mm-hmm. And even just before that, I mean in that's the like that's the book in which it happened. But even before that, in their final year at Hogwarts, they are definitely good troublemakers against Umbridge. <laughs> Absolutely. And their method of leaving school was quite memorable. Mm-hmm. And also part of that. Yeah. So like there's there's troublemakers and then there's good troublemakers. And being able to discern between those two uh, is important. And sometimes they're the same people. Mm-hmm. It's true. I was thinking about it also and. In- I love Ember, the Ember in the Ashes series by Saba Tahir, and I haven't talked about it in a couple episodes at least. In the first book, I think, there's a point at which Laia and Elias are trying to evade the marshals. So they're like on the run. No, it's the second book. So they're on the run in the second book, and they go to, they meet up with the tribes people from the many tribes in the city of Nur for this holiday called Rafana, where all of the tribes gather and they tell stories and they celebrate their ancestors. So they gather here and then the marshals figure out that they're there and so are trying to like find them. And 
Mamie Ryla, um, who is Elias's adopted mother, figures out a plan and they like have this great storytelling that tells this whole story and builds. She's a storyteller and so like has this power to build people up and to connect emotionally. So she builds all of this tension and all of this power up so that it's like on the verge of spilling over and it and then when it does spill over it provides cover for Elias and Laya to get out of Nur safely and to continue on their journey and it's just this like beautiful like the power of words and storytelling yeah actually that kind of reminds me of Star Lord and the rest of the cast of Guardians of the Galaxy using the dance off to mm. uh, distract the people in order to have enough time to save the what was it the universe i don't remember how yeah. exactly that was probably called, but that's usually like something saved like that. in galaxy stuff yeah well and speaking of the mcu i would also have to throw in there that steve rogers uh, has mm -hmm. been a good troublemaker since even before becoming captain america as he would get into fights to especially to defend others at the drop of a hat there is in fact a entire subgenre of fan fiction about steve rogers that a lot of it was happening just before uh, and then just after the Winter Soldier movie came out, which personally speaking for me, that's where the MCU canon ends because after that, everything kind of went off the rails. <laughs> but I did just that's watch beside the, the Eternals. Point. So. Uh, yeah, I haven't tried that yet. I, I don't necessarily hate everything in the MCU that's come after that. It's just the Avengers movies that consistently got the characters wrong, which bothers me. But mm -hmm. moving on. But there is this whole subgenre of fan fiction uh, around Steve and his best friend Bucky, where Bucky shows up at Avengers Tower and has to explain to the Avengers who all think that Steve Rogers is this perfect young man, lawful, good uh, Catholic choir boy who would never break a rule. <laughs> to uh, save someone's life or anything like that that no steve rogers is actually a incredibly troublemaking little punk who will <laughs> get into a fist fight over something that most people wouldn't even notice uh, because he will absolutely not put up with you know bigotry or slander or anything mm -hmm. like that uh, in his presence and uh, you have to follow him around which is apparently what bucky spent a fair amount of his childhood and adolescence doing uh, and make sure that he doesn't get himself killed even if he is a so super soldier <laughs> Or, you know, uh, arrested uh, and in t a terrible position, that kind of thing. Uh, and so I really love those stories because the revelation of uh, Steve as this incredible troublemaker is always pretty hilarious. And uh, he and Bucky are clearly having a good time. Yeah. So. And Agent Carter, who shows up yeah. in the Captain America series, but then also gets her own spinoff show, is similar to that in that she she actually kind of reminds me of McGonagall but there yes. she like toes the line and uses lawful yes for absolutely. chaotic good <laughs> she uses lawful for good and she uses chaotic for good so she's probably neutral in alignment because of that yeah I would say Steve is probably about the same like he clearly recognizes that there are good purposes for laws and some laws are okay but yeah. uh, he'll use them for his own purposes as necessary yeah but I love like particularly the way that Agent Carter will like she'll do something and she'll do like all the chaotic things and then when people try and call her on it she goes into lawful mode and so like following the letter of the law in order to not get in trouble or exactly yeah. And I particularly love how having a British accent in an American context helps her play into that. Yeah. <laughs> because Americans have certain preconceptions about the Brits. That's true. Yeah. And then as we dive into our readings, our first reading, as we mentioned, is Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. The prophet Jeremiah balks at the difficult tasks God has set for him. But God reminds Jeremiah of all the preparations God has already made and promises to continue to be with and help him. So one of the themes in this passage is the theme of youthful power. God says, I've been with you since you were in your mother's womb. And to Jeremiah's, I'm only a kid. God says, no, that, well, God doesn't say no. God says, yes, and you have power. Yeah. It reminded me of a lot of, and this goes into some holy troublemaking and some just holy making. But the justice movements like the Sunrise Movement, which is around climate activism and youth-led, or the March for Our Lives around gun control and safety, 
and youth activists like Patience Nabukalu from Uganda, Laura Aguilar from Colombia, Xie Bastida from Mexico and Chile area, which is two separate countries, but I think is maybe has parents from each. Sure. Brianna Fue, Fueyan from Samoa and Tsai Surui from Brazil. And they are all climate activists, some of them indigenous activists and some of them not indigenous activists, but all sure. of them are youth who have been showing up. Um, and there's a great article about them that we'll link to in our episode description. Great. And then as we go into the verses, in verse 6 we read, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. And here we have Jeremiah pulling what is very possibly the first instance of the I'm baby meme. Uh, which is something I'm honestly a little old for. So this is something I was introduced to by the young people on the internet. But there is an ongoing thing of uh, when you encounter a concept that is just, I am, I am not this adult today. I, I can't be an adult anymore today. I am done. I am uh, too young for this. I am not ready for this. Uh, the response is, I'm baby. And <laughs> I think we've all had days like that. So probably I have. No and we can that. link to the know your meme link. Uh, and just a quick warning that the initial story of where this apparently originally came from is a little concerning um, and involves a, a violent uh, incident. But uh, mm. after that, the rest of the stories about the meme are pretty funny. So, okay. And if you're completely unfamiliar with that, you are not alone because I have basically no idea either. I I have some younger friends on the internet who are very fond of that. Gotcha. And I, I learned that meme along with learning the uh, to use the word adult as a verb, as in uh, adulting. I've been using adulting in that way for quite some time now. It's true. Yeah. And I read verse six. Then I said, ah, becoming God, truly, I do not know how to speak for I am only a child. And immediately thought of like basically every young adult novel fantasy ever. <laughs> Right. But that's like, that's what we do. Like you make stories geared for one age. The main character is usually a year or two older than that. Yeah. So that goes for 11 year old whizches who take on evil to the boxcar children to Buffy when she first becomes the slayer. But it's all like, I can't do that. I'm only a kid. I'm only this many years old. I'm and some of them like they don't say that. And it's not until like adulthood that we look back and we're like, what were the adults doing that they let the <laughs> kids do that? How incompetent do you have to be to let your 11 year old save the world? Right. <laughs> yeah. And also like there has to be some sort of mechanism for the 11 year olds to do the thing for kids to for there to be a story that kids want to engage. Yeah. With. Well, and there are plenty of heroic things that kids can do in real life that also don't involve them like, you know, Taking going on. and blowing things up. Like that's yeah. not <laughs> I mean, I guess. I'm, yeah. <laughs> and then in verse 9 we read, then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth and the lord said to me now i have put my words in your mouth i like that this implies that god can also take god's words out of someone's mouth like mm. if if you can put them in you can probably take them out mm -hmm. and we have just passed martin luther king jr day and there were plenty of people using his words who should not have been uh, in a big way and uh, one of the common phrases that i was seeing again and again on twitter was get his words out of your mouth mm which is a very literal take on this. Uh, but yes, I do like the idea that God can do that too. Yeah, Agreed. And then in verse 10, I we read, See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And this reminded me of the book, The Giver. I love that book. Yeah, it's a good book. I didn't read it as a kid. I didn't read it until I was an adult, but I like oh, it. Oh, wow. Okay. But it takes conflict. It takes the breaking, plucking up, pulling down, destroying, overthrowing in order to build something new, to build and to plant. And so it takes breaking open the system that keeps all of the memories in just one person and putting some memories and some color back into the community for 
some other thing to happen for things to go a different way for things to begin to be repaired yeah our second reading for this episode is from first corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 13. paul reminds the diverse people of corinth that love is necessary for all spiritual gifts because it is through god's love that we have received them so one of the most obvious themes in this passage is of course love yay Woo-hoo. love as in Frozen, an act of true love can thaw a broken heart, which is to say sacrificial love or just like a protective kind of love. And not necessarily romantic. And not necessarily This passage is not necessarily about romantic love. Yeah. There's a bunch of Disney movies that actually have to do with love that are not about romantic love. So everything from Lilo and Stitch and what it means to be family, or Hana, um, to Frozen, to Encanto, which pretty soon we're going to start just having spoilers without any concern for your (laughs) well-being, folks. So you should either tell me. With regard to that movie particularly. Yes, with regard to Encanto. So you should either tell me or just watch the movie. Go ahead and watch the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But also one of the one of the like ways of understanding love that I really love the most um, comes from Martin Luther King Jr. And I learned it in my Theology of Martin Luther King class. And the quote, the full quote is, what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. Justice at its best is love correcting everything that stands against love. And I love that because it's so active and so clear about not using love as an excuse to not do something, but in fact that love motivates us to act. Yeah. I would also throw out there that I know a number of clergy who are very tired of this passage showing up in weddings. (laughs) And I get that because let me tell you, I I think like five sixths of the weddings that I've done, this reading has shown up and and that's, that gets old. I understand. But We can also take that opportunity to talk about the kinds of love that are present in a marriage that are not strictly romantic. Mm -hmm. Because if you're marrying someone, your love for that person should not only be the romantic kind of love. Mm -hmm. There should be more kinds of love there, too. And so uh, this passage allows you to talk about that in the sermon. And if you do that, you will find that you are way less irritated (laughs) by the the passage uh, than you would be otherwise. Cause, so you don't have to pretend that it's only about romantic love. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's a great opportunity to celebrate the community that is presumably gathering. Supporting these people. To yes. support folks. And if you need a refresher on the amazingness of love, check out the episode description where we will link to our episode from last Easter season about love and the many forms that it takes. Yeah. I should also point out that this is one of those readings where Emily and I talked about the same verses. This is probably an example of a type of love of the same kinds of things. I don't know, but same kinds of religious topics. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, but like that's that. okay. So when we jump into the verses for this reading, in verse one, we read, If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So what I'm getting from this verse is that the language of angels does not sound like the percussion section. <laughs> so probably not that similar to Klingon, which I guess would probably sound much more like the percussion section. So I wonder, is it closer to uh, Kenya, the the language of elves from Tolkien? Or mm. are there other languages that uh, may or may not have emerged on Earth that are similar to it? And uh, what human created or or naturally evolved language do you think is closest to the language of the angels? Mm. Yeah, I, so when I read that verse, I keyed in on the gong or clanging symbol (laughs) and the movie Smallfoot, which is adorable. There is a gong ringer who every morning wakes up the snail in the sky, which is to say the sun, by ringing a gong. That sounds like the worst alarm clock ever. I just... You know. Yeah, no. It's basically the alarm clock for the city, for the community. But they do it presumably out of love for their community and for upholding their traditions, but they do it under false pretenses because they do it because they've been told that the only way that the snail will get up and go across the sky is if they do it. 
And so it raises actually the question of like, what is love? And is it possible to do things in love when they're under false pretenses? And I think this gets to like tie back into weddings and stuff, right? If you are marrying someone and you are under the impression that they are a particular kind of person, for example, someone who does not abuse people or launder money, and then after you are married, you find out that they are, in fact, the kind of person that abuses people or launders money or whatever. Do the commitments that you made in love really hold up? And I would say, no, you are not bound to commitments made under false pretenses. Yeah, I might explore that a little bit by saying I'm familiar with using the phrase under false pretenses when a person knows that they are doing something not for the reasons that they're saying that they're doing it. Uh, And so in your example of Smallfoot, I think Smallfoot was doing those things genuinely, Mm -hmm. but had been told by people who were acting under false pretenses, a falsehood. And so Smallfoot's actions were genuine, but those people's weren't. Yes. And I would also extend that to your example of marriages, uh, where you may be marrying genuinely, but the person you are marrying is not. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of examples of that. So, yeah, I I just want to be careful about how we use that phrase, because I don't want to leave the impression that you marrying someone who wasn't honest with you is a dishonest thing that you're doing. Oh, that's yeah. That's not no, what that that's is. That's not what I was trying to say. I was trying to say. Right. I And I know that you weren't, okay. but I just wanted to be very careful about making sure everyone else knows yes. that too. Yes. So. You can do things genuinely. And if the other person is not, there's, right. I'm trying that's to say, not your but, fault. yeah, it's not your fault and it's okay to get out. And in fact, that might be the yes. loving thing to get out right. of those situations. Sometimes loving yourself is the best thing you can do. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, actually, uh, in verse 11, we read, When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. That's it. Now, you'll notice that it says childish ways and not childish things. And this gets uh, translated a few different ways. But... I would say that this verse is not saying that you have to put aside all the hobbies you had as a child. Like just because you liked something and enjoyed something as a child does not mean that you have to give that up when you become an adult. And there are a bunch of people who I would really love to give this speech to, but I don't think they'd listen to me. Mm. (laughs) And liking things that you have always liked is not childish. Now telling people that you know better than they do what they should or shouldn't like, well, that does strike me as kind of childish because that's the kind of childish thing that children sometimes try to pull. Mm. And when they get older, they realize that, oh, the mature thing to do here is not that. So That makes sense. Yeah. When I read about putting an end to childish ways, my first thought was, well, the doctor, at least the Matt Smith doctor, clearly didn't get this message because custard and fish sticks is definitely in the realms of childish and just his actions. Like he acts very childlike and childish. And I think that this passage, particularly this verse, is used a lot to justify childism, which I don't like, but it's like, oh. Prejudice against children. Mm -hmm. Yes, prejudice against children, which you can check out in our deep dive around childism that we did this past fall. Right. We are going to have so many links for this episode. <laughs> I know. And Pastor L. Dowd has, has done a lot around childism. But the like the ways that people have told me when, like, I like being childish, childlike. I like being having fun and being informal and being goofy. And then it frequently is like, no, you put your child put an end to your childish ways, like be mature, be professional, don't sit on the floor, because like, heaven forbid, we should sit on the floor. And so like, Paul is not saying don't be like a child, don't have fun, don't be casual. Jesus says, let the little children come to me. It's so it's like, I guess, in a similar way to which you were trying to be clear. I'm, (laughs) I want to be perfectly clear that this does not mean that children and what they do is bad frequently they are the best truth tellers among us the true maturity is being able to choose when is a good time to let your childlike characteristics out to play and when is a good time to truly display your maturity Mm -hmm. and then 
Our gospel reading for this episode is Luke chapter 4, verses 21 through 30, picking up from the end of last week. After hearing Jesus claim his identity with the words of the prophet Isaiah, the people of Nazareth are impressed to hear such a thing from Joseph's son. Jesus' response prompts rage. So one of the themes from this episode is what happens at returns. And I will say, spoilers for Encanto for all those of you who have not yet seen it. But this reminded me a lot of Bruno, who quote unquote goes away. And then when he returns, he returns for good reasons. But part of why he went away and all of that is because of the rumors that happen and the ways that people blamed him for things that he could not control. And so the idea of like Jesus coming back and then being like, okay, and then you're going to want this from me because I'm your like golden child now and I'm not going to do that. Or even in other gospels, not going to be able to do that. And then everybody gets mad at Jesus. And so it's a similar like Bruno faces that a lot as well. Yeah. Speaking of putting aside childish ways. Yeah. And then in verse 22, we read, All spoke well of Jesus and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, is not this Joseph's son? There's this like amazement and almost disbelief that like, but we know him. He grew up with us. How is this possible? And it actually reminded me of in Battlestar Galactica, there are 12 Cylon models total and seven of them are like reproduced a bunch, but then there are five Cylons that weren't copied and So when it comes out that they exist, there's a whole bunch of like, wait, aren't they one of us? And for those who are the Cylons, they're like, aren't I one of them? And trying to figure out like, but I thought I was human. What does this mean? And we thought they were human. And yeah. Sure. I have to say, I don't know that I've heard this verse that way before, but this time when I heard verse 22, I thought, does this mean that Joseph was just like really clumsy with his words and could not say something gracious to save his life? Oh, I haven't thought of that. <laughs> Is that why we don't hear from him much in the Bible? <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? And then uh, when we read the first part of verse 23, Jesus said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure thyself. And despite great provocation, I would like to point out that Jesus apparently did not immediately reply to this with, I'm the son of God, not a doctor, Jim. (laughs) Although if DeForest Kelly from the original series of Star Trek had been there at the time playing Dr. McCoy, he almost certainly would have. So nice. Um, And then in verses 26 and 27, we read, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So this is Jesus pointing to outsiders who were part of the work of God in these verses. And it reminded me of Rey in Star Wars. So full disclosure, I do not consider episode nine to be canon in my world because much like my MCU world has a lot. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Cause so much just went in a not great way, mm-hmm. but I love the idea of Ray being just like unknown to everyone and on her own, not particularly like special or blessed, but, and yet, she this outsider it receives the power of the force in new ways and then finally in verse 30 it says but jesus passed through the midst of them and went on his way so like how when i when i mentally picture this what am i supposed to be picturing like did he misty step as in D &D? or did he apparate like in harry potter So for those who aren't familiar with these, Misty Step involves disappearing from one spot and appearing 20 feet away. Mm -hmm. Apparating, you can disappear in one spot and reappear much, much further away. Uh, The Misty Step is specifically 20 feet. Or did he use the become ethereal shout uh, like in Skyrim, uh, which would have made him translucent and able to move through solid objects? Mm -hmm. Or did he just parkour his way out (laughs) of the crowd and like jump on people and get through them that way and i have to say of the all the mental pictures i have that one is my favorite because i love the idea of jesus parkouring his way out of a crowd (laughs) that is hilarious i love that yeah teleportation probably not the the route 
I mean, I think that that would probably like get included because there's a few bits in the Bible that involve what we would call teleportation. Uh, Philip, after he meets the uh, Ethiopian eunuch uh, being one of them, he mm. disappears from one place and reappears in another. And so I think that would have been described. So if he's just making his way through a crowd without being stopped by them, I think parkour is the obvious yeah. choice. It's one of those like the crowd gets so it's like, oh, I wonder if it's like in Lord of the Rings when Frodo and Sam, I think this is in the extended version only, but when Frodo and Sam in Return of the King are in Mordor and going towards the Mount, towards Mount Doom, and they get caught up in this army, and then somebody is going to investigate them, and so they like start a fight, and everybody is like so quick to start a fight that they can just like slip away into a tent and sure, absolutely. Also, they're hobbits, so it's easier to slip away. That helps. Thanks for joining us. Catch us next time when we'll discuss the nerdery connections to the scripture readings for the fifth Sunday after Epiphany with our special guest, Susanna Porter. This podcast has been produced by us, Kay Roloff and Emily Ewing. For more fun, check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Nerds at Church or contact us at nerds at church at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcast. If you want access to our uncut guest episodes and interviews, live Q&As, and more, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdsatchurch. As the ancient Christian said, Pax Obiscum. Obiscum.